Welcome to Glenview Community Church's Speaker Forum. Um, we are an open and an affirming church where we follow in the ways of Jesus and love and, and support and are with all God's people. Uh, tonight's Speaker Forum uh, is going to be uh, with, with Lindsay Hammond, Restored Justice, and Betsy Martin, who is the chair of Fiat, who's going to, uh, our Faith in Action team is going to tell us more about it. Betsy? Sure. Um, I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Lindsay Hammond, uh, who's policy director for Restore Justice. Lindsay leads the organization's policy development and advocacy group, which focuses on sentencing reform for youth and emerging adults serving extreme sentences. Lindsay brings more than 17 years of nonprofit experience to Restore Justice. You can't believe that when you look at her, but <laughs> it's true. And um, most recently, she worked as the Associate Director of State Policy at Community Renewal Society, specializing in criminal legal reform and restoring rights and opportunities for people with criminal records. Many of you may know Lindsay from trips we have taken with her to Springfield as we lobbied to pass bills to end wealth-based detention in Illinois, protect survivors of human trafficking, increase employment and housing opportunities for people with records, and legislation that led to the most expansive sealing of felony records in the nation. That's a great, great accomplishment. Tonight, Lindsay will tell us about her work with Restore Justice and let us know ways we can become engaged in advocacy for important policy changes in our state. For, uh, I just would like to say that the presentation will last 40 to 45 minutes, um, followed by um, uh, short remarks from Nelson Morris, who is a colleague of Lindsay's uh, and who has lived some of these experiences and can tell us what, that, what the impact is. Um, if you have any questions for Lindsay or Nelson, Put them in the chat and we will record them and we will make sure Lindsay has those questions. Lindsay and Nelson have those questions to, they can answer at the end of the program. So without further ado, Lindsay, let's, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you so much, Betsy. It is such a joy and a privilege to be with you tonight. Thank you so much for extending this invitation. I am so grateful to be able to talk about my passion and what I consider my ministry at Restore Justice. And I am so grateful to have my colleague, Nelson Morrison here to present with me. Nelson is um, recently been named a Represent Justice Ambassador with a, a prestigious national um, fellowship that he's attained. He um, is a wonderful advocate and leader, husband, father, grandfather, and many more things. And I'm gonna pause for a minute and let Nelson introduce himself a little bit more and we'll get started. Hello everybody, it's very nice to see your faces and meet you. Uh, my name is Nelson Morris, I'm an impacted individual. I did just shy of 30 years of incarceration uh, as a juvenile. And uh, now I'm pro 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 project associate for Restore Justice and it's, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much, Nelson. Um, you will get a chance to hear more from Nelson, but Nelson um, was a formal juvenile life without parole was the sentence he had. So he is an expert for us to learn from tonight. And I'm really grateful to do that. Every time I talk with him, I learn from him. So this is our agenda for tonight. We'd like to just briefly go over the problem of incarceration and how we got here, share with you about Restore Justice and the work that we do, we want to focus specifically about our work to abolish juvenile life without parole and then give you some ideas about how you might become active in this work. And of course, as Betsy mentioned, save time at the end for your questions and answers. So the problem that we'd like to talk with is the problem of mass incarceration. Now, I'm sure for many of you, this graph is a familiar um, illustration you've probably seen before. This is a graph of the incarceration rate in the United States. And as you can see over the last 40 years, the number of people that have been incarcerated in the US has increased by 500%. So we are the world's leader in incarceration. And these changes have been driven by sentencing changes, not by crime rates. 
So we're gonna go over some of those sentencing changes that have occurred that have created this problem. You'll see a really steep increase occurs around the 90s and thereafter. That is when across the country and the nation and states at the local level, there was the war on drugs. There is a movement to be tough on crime. The federal government even gave states money to build prisons and to incarcerate people for longer periods of time. That is where we got policies such as mandatory minimums, truth and sentencing, which require people to serve every single day of their sentence without any way to be released. Also, I wanted to note in Illinois in 1978, that is the year that we ended parole in Illinois. So there is no longer parole opportunities for most people in Illinois. So not only did we increase sentencing, lock people up for longer, we also took away opportunities for meaningful release and reconsideration at the same time. This has had devastating effects on our communities um, because of the number of people that are lost from those communities. It's increased recidivism rate and it's also a great drain on our resources. Every time I see that, it blow my mind. So uh, this, this graph, uh, as you can see, within, the, within less than 40 years, the life population, the de facto life pop population increased fivefold across the country, but crime declined. You know, so, you know, in my words, the conclusion with that, that would be uh, uh, locking people up for extreme lengths of time. Uh, it don't make us no safer. You know, and the numbers show it. So Restore Justice was founded six years ago. We're a statewide level organization that focuses on policy sentences and reforming extreme sentences. So people that are sentenced for decades and decades of in prison. We have a particular fo focus on emerging adults, which is usually defined as individuals that are 25 and younger. We work directly with people who have lived experience with the criminal justice system, family members and advocates like yourself. So uh, this is one of my favorite uh, graphs because I just think it stands out. It, it really shows you. Uh, this is a comparison. This shows you, uh, it's a pie chart that shows you the discrepancy between race uh, with, with, with youth that have life and de facto life sentences. Uh, the black is the blue. 68.2% per, 68 of this graph is the black that's incarcerated for li uh, life and de facto life. Whereas only 14.6% of African-Americans make up Illinois' population. So only 14% of the population is black, but 68% is incarcerated with natural life or de facto. Wow. That's, yeah, it's amazing. So this is who we serve here in Illinois and by de yes. facto life sentences, we mean people who have a sentence of 40 years or more. Years or more. Yes. I had a life sentence. And, and, and yes, a de facto sentence is somebody who had 40 years or more. Well, basically, they're not, when they do get, when they get out, if they, if they alive, you know, if they, you know, they still might be too old to even live a productive life. Right. So Restore Justice works on many issues that contribute to extreme sentencing. So in addition to juvenile life without parole, we also work on issues of gun enhancements. Illinois has one of the highest enhancements in the country. So on top of an underlying felony that someone may be charged with, additionally, they could be charged with anywhere to 15 to 20 to 25 years to life on top of that sentence if a gun's involved, even if it wasn't discharged in some cases. We also work on issues around retroactivity, which is making any reforms that are passed by the General Assembly apply retroactively to people that are currently incarcerated. That is a huge need in order to address the prison population. Um, in addition to working on issues around parole, um, we think about transfer so that children and young adults aren't charged as adults and what's that means. Accountability theory and felony murder are also these wide um, policies that we have in our state that allow people to be charged for crimes even if they didn't commit them. So we have very wide interpretations where people can be charged with murder because they had knowledge of it, even if they didn't actually commit the murder. 
So that causes more people to um, have their lives devastated by incarceration because of some of these wide ranging policies. Now, in addition to sentencing policies, um, which take a lot of effort, they're long-term issues, there are shorter term things we work on as well. I mentioned we have a family network and so we're constantly thinking about ways that we can help increase um, access to family members to their loved ones that are incarcerated. Um, last year, we created a position with the help of the Department of Corrections and Senator Fine and Representative Gable to create a point of contact in the Department of Corrections. So family members had someone they could go to if they had an issue. Um, and that point of contact has been a great success in helping to resolve some of the issues, but the work isn't done that yet. So we continue to work on that. Um, solitary confinement is another significant issue right now in Illinois. There is no limit to the amount of time someone can be placed in solitary confinement. So people are confined not only for days, weeks, months, but years and decades within the Department of Correction, which creates a lot of trauma um, and is a huge violation of human rights. So there are many, many issues related to incarceration that we're also trying to address as well. In addition to our policies, we have many programs. So what do we do? We have a lot of programs that's, that's turning to be kind of interesting. We have the Return to Citizen Network, which simply is uh, people that's returning home from long sentences, usually 20 years or more, uh, uh, get together and we mobilize and we have specialists come and talk to us about finances and uh, uh, we have officers come one one meeting and tell and, and talk to us how we should be, how, how we should approach also how we should conduct ourselves, different things that a return to citizen should know, this is what we do monthly, every month. Uh, Future Leadership Appren Apprenticeship Program, FLAP, is, is a program where guys can come home and if you're picked to be a part of FLAP, Restore Justice will take you and teach you advocacy and will pay you to learn about advocacy, all aspects of advocacy, and keep you until you get a job, give you benefits, like FLAP is everything. And then we have the youth advocacy class. The youth advocacy class is a class that I teach a couple of days out the week uh, to at-risk children. Uh, we also have, uh, at, at, uh, at Precious Blood, I'm, I'm sorry. We also have youth mentors. I'm also a youth mentor at Precious Blood, that program. And then you also have communities and relatives of Illinois incarcerated children, which is, we like to say, CRIT. I'm going to be honest with y'all. Even though I'm employed with Restorative Justice, I had to have, I had to ask Lindsay what that meant. You know, I knew what CRIT meant, C-R-I-I-C, but I even didn't even know that. I had to teach, you know, find out myself. I'm a, I, I had to be honest with y'all. So CRIT is uh, uh, a program that Julie Anderson, uh, our director of outreach, started. And it's about, it's with basically families. It's about families. Families of incarcerated people uh, supporting each other, passing out information, uh, things of that nature. They do trips, they travel, they, they get together uh, yearly and they, and they travel and they bring loved ones to Menard and, and heal corrections to see loved ones. It's, it's beautiful. I know because I used to be on the receiving end of the, the visits. Uh, and then we accompany returning citizens to get their IDs and register because it's very difficult. And the reason why it's difficult because when you're incarcerated right before they release you, they give you your prison ID and they tell you that your ID, this ID, it will be sufficient to go to the DOV and it will be like a, a, a temporary thing and they'll give you a temporary slip. No, they don't do it. They don't respect it. They don't honor it on the streets, but they, they continue to make this the policy of prison. And there's a lot of roadblocks and blocks and hurdles. But because we've been through this so many times, we have built bridges and made friends and we have people that really do help us, uh, help us get guys their IDs and such. So we help them and we accompany them as well as uh, uh, get their driver's license or anything that they may need. And also when we register, when we get out, we have to register. We like to be with the guys when they register with them in person. So, uh, hello everybody. My name is Nelson Morris, and I just want to tell you a little about, a little, about a little bit about me, about myself. 
when I was 17, I was charged, eventually convicted of a double murder, homicide, and I was sentenced to natural life in 35 years. I'm not one to really make excuses, and I like to tell people through the door I was guilty. I I, I did it. I, I I took someone loved one. I I took someone's life. Uh, when I was younger, I I was raised. I was a latchkey kid. My mother was a single parent. Uh, just her and I, and I had a lot of time to myself. I hit the streets, you know, and uh. Later on, my mother got addicted to cocaine and things just went spiraling downhill and I started selling drugs to live and survive. And I got robbed a couple of times and I got tired of getting robbed. And the next time they came, one thing led to another and I, I killed some people. I killed two people. I took somebody's son and somebody's father. So I just like to I always just like to get that out the way because I do feel like even though throwing away my life for it as a child wasn't the, the equivalent of what I should have got, I do know that I took somebody's life and people was hurt behind it. So, so uh, Miller, we have a decision, a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision called Miller versus Alabama that said that it was basically unconstitutional to give a child mandatory natural life. It was cr uh, 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 cruel and unusual punishment. So a lot of us was uh, resentenced. I myself was resentenced. Uh, November 2018, and my I, 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 my sentence became a, from a natural life and 35 year sentence to a 60 year sentence. Um, under uh the old law, so I get 50 percent good time. So all I had to do was 30. I did my time, and I came home. And right before I came home, I had a beautiful, beautiful boss, Joby Cates, that we used to come see me in Menard monthly, and. Once I lost, I lost my mother and Joby just kind of took me under her wing. And when I came home, I paroled to Joby home and uh, did my house rest there and got, and she employed me. And now I'm program associate for Restore Justice. And, and since then I married my childhood sweetheart and I've reconnected with my, with my children. And now I'm pop pop. I have beautiful grandchildren and, and uh, I recently just did get employed by uh, Represent Justice as an ambassador, and I'm really excited about that to see what that brings. And yeah, and this is why mandatory naturalized citizens should be abolished, in my, in my opinion. And thank you for your time. I just wanted to get that out. Nelson, could you also describe what it's like to grow up in prison, like learning to shave and, and just, you know, what that experience was like? Yeah, I like to tell people that I, I, my first shave came from a convict. I learned to shave in jail. I never, I didn't have facial hair when I was incarcerated. So my first shave to uh, everything, to how to carry yourself, to everything I learned in prison, prison etiquette. You know, uh, I, I unfortunately I wasn't very school. I, I wasn't good in school. I I, I couldn't. I had problems uh, uh, focusing when I was younger, so I I didn't read very well. And uh, I taught myself how to read in prison. I had a lot of time, and my mother had got herself clean and sober, and she used to send me books, and and I taught myself how to read, and so everything I I, I got to contribute everything to prison. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And one last thing, could you share what you do at Precious Blood? Um, talk more about your mentorship and your leadership there. Yes, I, I mentor children at Precious Blood on, 50, on 51st and Elizabeth. Uh, just a couple of days after we just hang out, uh, uh, drive them places, listen to, they, listen to their problems, laugh, joke with them. And uh, a couple of more days after the week, uh, I teach a class there. And it's just an advocacy class about policy and teaching them how policy affect their life. You know, uh, teaching them it's the reason why they got to wear uniforms. Somebody thought that policy up for them. How do they change it? Do you like the color of your uniforms? Uh, you know, and then we also like pick a project. We had a class pick a project. Right now we are fixed. We 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 are in the in the process of getting the the alleyway of of precious blood uh, repaved because it's horrible. And we I'm teaching them how to go through the motions of calling three one one and the alderman and going through you know and things of that nature. 
right now. That's what we're doing right now in the class. Thanks, Nelson. And there's one question in the chat from Nancy. What education did the prison provide to you as a juvenile? Huh, okay, so this is interesting. So when you're in when, when you're incarcerated, everything is by levels and levels is your outdate. So even school, jobs, everything. So when you have natural life, you don't have an outdate. So even if you try to go to school, they never put you on the list or you never get a chance to get to school because they're going to always put the person with an outdate ahead of you. So people that had natural life, I didn't get my GED until I got resentenced. You know, I, even though I, I, I wanted to and it was not, it wasn't like I was in prison, just, you know, I taught myself how to read. It wasn't like I was in prison just not doing anything, but they wouldn't even allow me to get my GED because I had natural life. But as soon as I got my conviction changed, I immediately got in school and got my GED, you know. And so that's that's about all you're going to get if you have a, a, a life sentence as a juvenile is a GED if you're lucky, if you're lucky. Thank you for sharing, Nelson. That's just so hard to believe. It, it goes against what our perceptions are often of what incarceration is like and what rehabilitation should be like, you know, not to even allow you that opportunity to get that basic education. So yeah, you will go ahead. Yeah, you're right. You know, and sometimes when you don't have it, when you're incarcerated, a lot of things change as you grow. When you're a child, you know, you think different as a man as you do a child. I'm different at 48 as I was, I was 17. And, you know, as you grow and mature, even though it's in a jail cell, you want to know more. You want to educate yourself. Nobody want to be ignorant. So, you know, everybody should have a chance to be educated, no matter they outdate. I don't think a person outdate should, you know, hinder on their education. It's, I just think that's cruel. Yeah, absolutely. I see another question from Betsy Nelson. Did you feel prepared for life outside when you got out of prison? If not, what do you think should happen? I was very fortunate that uh, even though I couldn't go to school, I was fortunate enough to have people that, that give me like good ideas. So I had a lot of mail order classes and, and, and things like that. So like, even when I got out, I had already took a class on how to write a check, uh, how to budget, uh, things like that. I actually took a mail order class before I came home. I took it upon myself to do these things like that. So I called myself, giving myself as much as an uplift or, you know, as I could from, you know, before I came home. I always try to prepare for that, you know, for my free, like that. And uh, when I got out of prison, and when, I, and when I did get out of prison, the, the, when I got out of prison, the people didn't even send me. This, I just got to tell you this. The people wouldn't even send me to the place where I was supposed to win. After doing 30 years, they put me in the same crime-infested area that they snatched me from, even though that was nowhere near where I was supposed to win. I was supposed to win to Evanston. They sent me to the south side of Chicago and Inglewood. The prison system don't care. And, and I'm not making this up. This is just what happened to me the day I got out after doing 30 years. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's... No, thanks for sharing. That is hard to believe that you had a parole location lined up and it wasn't even honored. You know, you had a really good place to go and we're glad you made it to that location. Yeah. We are going to talk now more about juvenile life without parole and what's happening in Illinois. Um, there'll be some more time at the end of our presentations. Um, so any other questions you have for Nelson, um, feel free to share those too, so we can get those answered. It, it's um, such a resource to have Nelson here to share. Um, but we know that you wanna know more about abolishing juvenile life without parole, what Nelson has been talking about. We are the only country in the world that sentences kids to die in prison without the possibility of parole. So far, 25 states in Washington, D.C. have eliminated juvenile life without parole, and we would love for Illinois to be the 26th state. So right now, we have a bill that is in the Illinois General Assembly, House Bill 1064, that would abolish juvenile life without parole for most people. Last session in um, the spring session, it passed out of the House, 
because we're in a two-year session, it's still alive. So it's currently in the Senate chambers. President Harmon is the sponsor. Um, and we are hoping that it has the possibility for moving later in this year. So we want to tell you more about House Bill 1064. We know that there's a lot of problems with juvenile life without parole. Like you heard from Nelson's story, he was a kid. He was 17. It doesn't make sense to judge any of us on decisions we make as young people for the rest of our lives. Um, we know from science that our brains continue to develop well into our 20s and until we're 25 years old in, in some cases. There's not a line where we magically become an adult and therefore should be held responsible. Many of our laws already recognize that. If you think about laws around voting or renting a car, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, those um, parts of our statutes recognize the brain science and emerging adults are different. But when it comes to locking people up in our criminal code, um, we don't have the same understanding of brain development and of um, accountability. The Supreme Court has ruled over and over again, as Nelson mentioned, and benefited from Miller versus Alabama. Other decisions have upheld that and said children are not only uniquely different, but they're more capable of rehabilitation because none of us are the same people we are as young people. We continue to develop and mature, and that makes young people even more likely to succeed in rehabilitation and, and becoming wonderful people in their community like Nelson is now um, for so many young people and for his family. International law also forbids juvenile life without parole, um, makes you wonder how this still happens in our country, but it does. And finally, there's no research that says juvenile life without parole makes us safer. There's no research that says that that is something that um, decreases crime. So House Bill 1064 would create an opportunity for people who are 20 or younger um, when they're sentenced to either first degree murder or a term of natural life imprisonment to be eligible for review. It doesn't mean that they would be automatically released. It just means that they would have the opportunity to go before the prisoner review board and petition for reconsideration after serving a 40 year sentence. So this is a very conservative bill in that sense that people still have to serve a life sentence before they have that opportunity for review. This is a natural progression of legislation that was passed back in 2018, which created the first opportunities for youthful parole, but it carved out a couple of offenses like these. So we're hoping to expand that so that um, most people are eligible for parole consideration. This was a perspective only bill which means it only applies to people that are sentenced in the future. It doesn't deal with retroactivity, which I mentioned a little while ago, for people that are currently incarcerated. So that is something we still hope to address. Now, this is one of the things I really like to do in my trainings is to talk about why this bill matters to you and to your community. So I hope that you might consider advocating um, for this issue. So I wanted to take a minute to ask, invite you to share in the chat if you were to talk to a friend after hearing um, this presentation and what Nelson has shared and, and what we just talked about, about why this issue might resonate with you, if you were talking to your legislator about it, what do you think you might share? Um, to give you an idea, you might say as a person of faith, you know, I really believe in redemption and that people um, deserve an opportunity for grace, you know, that we're not defined by one moment in time, by one mistake for the rest of our lives. Um, you might say something about justice, or you might say something about, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to spend all these resources locking wonderful people away. So I really do invite you to participate right in the chat, what you think this means to you. And, and Nelson, do you have any other things you want to add about this bill or why it's important? Oh, we can't hear you, Nelson. No child should be thrown away. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yeah, uh, this is extremely important to me because it's just really simple. No child should be thrown away. No child life should be thrown away. You know, even if the, you know, they make mistakes, we all make mistakes, but no child life should be thrown away like that. You know, life is precious and we shouldn't throw it away. And I think that's at the, at, the, at the gist of it. That's why this bill is so important because they are throwing our children lives away. So does anybody wanna come off of mute or put in the chat why this is important to you or why you think this issue matters?
I'll give you a minute to think about it. I, I think it's worth taking a minute to pause here because why something matters to you is the most important thing that you can share with your legislators. It's not something that they can say is wrong because it's your experience. And legislators want to know exactly what their constituents are thinking and why. So it's it's really one of the most powerful forms of advocacy. And you're right, the U.S. needs to get in step with the rest of the world. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. So it sounds like you might say, um, you know, this is out of line with the rest of the world. We need to catch up to be more fair. Does anybody else want to add anything in the chat or, or just share it out loud if that's easier? Thanks, Tony. We are all not the same person we were in our 20s, 30s, and so on, exactly. You know, I don't even recognize 17-year-old Nelson. The Nelson that was coming through the system, and people ask me, well, how do you do all that time? And I'm like, I don't remember the, the guy that started that time. You know, I don't even recognize him. You change drastically from, you know, yeah, not the same person. Yeah. Thank you, Betsy. You shared, um, I think anyone, but especially children, should have encouragement to change as they grow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Bro, their exactly. lives are also wasted while incarcerated and unable to be educated at a greater rate. Definitely. What is the purpose of, of incarceration and at what point, you know, do people get a chance to be accessed on, like Nelson said, not the person they started with when they entered, but who they are today. Nancy said the incarceration of children is in itself contrary to my faith and to known science. The idea of life without parole and the implication that sentence currently has on their prison experience makes this a more dangerous society while it ruins lives. Amen. Faith and science are, are great um, reasons to point out there. And thanks, Tony, I, for not recognizing your 24-year-old self, I agree. <laughs> so y'all have some really good answers and I can tell you're thinking about this. Um, so I'd just invite you to reflect on it some more. I know many of you um, probably live in Senator Fine's district in the Glenview area. Senator Fine is a co-sponsor of this legislation, she's so supportive, um, but I know she would appreciate hearing from you about this issue. Um, and, and if you don't live in her district, I know your legislators would love to hear from you as well, particularly in the Senate where this bill is now. So I'm gonna transition to some opportunities for how you can get involved. So for upcoming trainings, uh, we have virtual legislative meetings, activity trainings, and that's basically where we can teach you how to set up meetings with your local legislators, whether it's your senator or your house rep, uh, uh, how the meeting should go and, and things like that. Uh, we have classes on that. And these are really good classes. I learned a lot from them. Uh, then we know we uh, the in-person legislative advocacy training uh, that's going to be in Riverdale, Chicago. And our registry, you know, this is our registry. So hopefully Thanks, we see Nelson. you now. And this didn't fit on the slide, but we also were doing a clemency training coming up in February. If, if you have a loved one that's incarcerated and you want to learn more about that process on this page um, where our, all of our advocacy trainings are listed, you can find out more about that as well. And the clemencies have become a really good tool for people coming home, more so than in a long time. Yeah, and just the background information about clemencies, that's where you can petition the governor to be released. Um, so if, for many people, that is the last ditch only thing that they can do at this point. And it's up to the governor to decide whether or not to grant clemencies. It's very few number of people get them. Um, they, they are not easy to get. Another way we invite you to connect with us is to join our advocacy team. This is a group of advocates that are really passionate and interested in learning more. We send our advocacy team um, almost weekly updates during the session, which is happening right now, and will go until April 9th of this year. We also have optional Zoom meetings on Friday from 12 to 1230, where we share the latest about what's happening in Springfield that week, what is the most timely action people can take and share with their networks, 
It's an optional time. Um, you can come stop in, join us any Friday that you're free. We'd love to see you and we'd love for you to be part of our advocacy team. You can sign up at restorejusticeillinois.org. There is another action we wanted to invite you. So if you do one thing after today, and I'll, when I finish sharing, I'll drop this link in the chat so it'll be easier for you to get to. Um, but we are currently doing a take action right now around supporting the Safety Act. Uh, the Safety Act is the omnibus bill that passed almost a year ago that included the Pretrial Fairness Act, which ends money bond and wealth-based detention in Illinois starting next year. It also had reforms related to sentencing, to police accountability. It's a very significant step forward for criminal justice reform in Illinois. However, many of you might have heard in the news that legislators are talking about rolling it back, about creating more penalties. Um, everything we talked about in the beginning of the presentation, there's talk about increasing penalties again, increasing incarceration, trying to incarcerate people longer to address concerns about crime, which is a very hot topic in this season as legislators are running for re-election. So we are asking folks to reach out to their legislators and, and urge them not only to protect the Safety Act, but to stand against any potential bills that may happen this session that would increase penalties um, or that would contribute to more incarceration, because we know that's not the answer. So I invite you to consider sending this email. It won't take you long through our tool and adding before you send it why it matters to you, because that will really make a difference to the legislators you're sending it to. Then finally, I could not do a training without sharing this information. If you don't know who represents you, please take a minute to check it out on the elections website for the state. This is where you can look at it. Another cool thing to note is that the maps are up for the new districts. So if you're wondering if you've been mapped into a new district, the tool on the elections website for Illinois will let you know that. You just put in your address and it'll tell you. So that is some homework for you. And some additional homework if you're feeling really excited is think about um, as much as you can try to find out what you know about your state legislature. So you have a state rep and a state senator that represents you. Look at their bios, look at their websites, look at the news stories, see if you can figure out where they might stand on these issues and what they're passionate about. Another cool site that I highly recommend is illinoisunshine.org. This is a website where you can see who gives the money. So you learned a lot about someone's self-interest um, and what's important to them by looking at their donor list. So that's another way you can find out more about your elected officials and become more educated about engaging with them and, and relating to them. So if you want to stay in touch with us, you can reach us, me, myself, Nelson Moore's project associate, or Ms. Reverend Lindsay Hammond, our policy director, uh, Illinois, I mean, uh, uh, L. Hammond at restorejustice.org and Morris at restorejustice.org. And these are ways we can stay in touch. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing and invite questions now. I think there's some in the, um, can you see them or is the yeah. here? Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. Here's an interesting one. So to what degree is solidarity of family used and under what circumstances? Well, it's, it's used when they think that you're going to hurt yourself, they will put you, they will strip you of everything and put you on side of their family. And whenever it's, and they use it as a disciplinary tool as well. So if you catch a ticket and you go to segregation, they can put you in the cell by yourself for up to 29 days, 30 days. Depends on what facility you're in. It's different rules for different facilities. Thank you. It is really overused and it's particularly used for people that are acting out and suffering from mental illness. And instead of directing people towards treatment, um, they're directed more into solitary, which exacerbates the problems that they're experiencing. We know this is a huge issue in some of the institutions and, and lawsuits are happening around that issue 
um, but it's used a lot as a form of control and punishment for people um, acting a certain way. And sometimes their behavior is directly related to a need that they have that's not being met. Um, so it's not a, it's not a fair um, response at all. And the, the cells that people are, are placed in are, are the size of a parking spot. Think of where you park your car, where someone is left in for most of the day. Um, this, this isn't exactly um, solitary confinement for everybody, but one thing that's been really concerning to us at Restore Justice and other places is the impact of COVID on people who are incarcerated. So while they may not be directly placed in solitary, the net result of COVID happening is that people are locked in their cells without any movement except for maybe 15 minutes, would you say, Nelson? I myself was, I myself did three months in uh, solitary confinement in, in a, a Menard, in Menard, and uh, I also did uh, in, in Pontiac. But in Pontiac, I, didn't, I was in a cell where I couldn't even tell you if it was day or night. It was just a steel cell, and they kept a, a, a light on 24-7, and you didn't know if it was day or night. And I could tell you firsthand that you you, you experienced sleep dep deprivation, uh, 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 hal you hallucinate, uh, it's hard to stay focused, uh, it really is like torture. It really is. Dory, can we unmute Dory? I can't unmute her, but I asked her to unmute. Dory, you have to unmute. There we go. Good. Were you allowed to read while you were in solitary? Okay, well, when I was in solitary, they take everything and then they keep you and they take everything and, and, and all you have is a mattress and a pair of underwear. And then they make you wait 10 days like that. And then they would give you your property and you're going to have so many magazines, so many books, so much writing material, you know, like uh, three books, three magazines, and they will and like that. And then you, you can have your people like send you through the mail magazines and books. Wow. Nelson, yeah. when you weren't in solitary, were you limited to belongings that could fit in a box? Was that enforced when you were? Yes, inside? yes, they, yes. It's a, it's a. They, they give you two boxes. They give you a, a, a property box that uh, you could put like folders and envelopes in, and uh, they give you a big box where you can put like your, 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 your clothes and your cosmetics and such. And everything you own must fit in the boxes. And you can, in, in your property box, you cannot put nothing but paper in that box. So you can't put other stuff in that box. So everything you own must fit in this box. And what happens if you have stuff that doesn't fit in the box? They can discipline you. And if you get so many disciplines, they can send you to segregation. No. Nelson, are there any statistics as to the age of most of the gang members that are doing so much of the violence these days? I mean, are well, they teenagers or are they young adults or a mix? Unfortunately, both. You know, it's younger, it's, it's young adults that started as teenagers, you know, that started as adolescents, you know, most of, most of the time, and I was gang affiliated most of the time. And I could just tell you how I became gang affiliated. I became gang affiliated because it was all around me. That's what was around me. That's what was at my school. That's what was on my block. That was, you know, you couldn't even get off, off the block without passing these guys. You couldn't, you, you know, like, that's what it was. That was my reality. And, you know, it made life at the time, as a child, I'm thinking this would make my life easier. I'd be protected. But all it did was cause me problems and aches and pains. And I'm still trying to recuperate from, from this day. There's a question from Meredith that is, um, do you have research showing negative impacts on youth serving long sentences? For example, oh, oh you answered it. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay answered it. All right. <laughs> uh, 
okay, there's a new message. And the rest of the question was um, <laughs> worse off when in prison longer versus shorter sentences or given probation. And then there's a nice website there. Lindsay, you want to talk about that? There's a website, link it good. Sure, the, this is just a, a fantastic report on emerging adults and the impact. Um, there is absolutely a, a greater impact on, on young people the longer they serve. I mean, think about what Nelson shared about what it's like. There's more trauma that's endured the longer someone's incarcerated. Incarceration is a form of trauma. Um, and the longer someone suffers from that, they're removed from their family members, from their support system, the, the more um, that damages somebody and it, it damages their spirit. It damages, you can have physical issues. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface about um, I don't know, Nelson, do you want to see anything what it's like to get health care when you're incarcerated? Aspirin is they everything. That's they give you as uh, uh, ibuprofen. If you can break your back, they're gonna give you two ibuprofens that go to your cell. That's it. And you know, it's really scary because I know quite a few guys personally who have had cancer and who have had to have their families move heaven and earth to fight for them because the prison didn't want to give them any kind of medical care. And they had cancer. You know, like, and they really had to have, like, hire lawyers and everything just to get their loved one, you know, get treated for cancer. They don't care. And I always end it like that because they don't. Yeah, they don't. They, they, the medical, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scam. It's a crock, the medical system in jail. So it can have a lot of long-term effects on you. Yes. So is it is it financially they can't afford to give treatment to the prisoners or they just choose not to? Everything is allocated under security. Am I right, Lindsay? So security trumps everything. So officers getting paid, uh, pensions, that's what most of the money that is allocated for us on every aspect go to. Security, the officers. And food. Not even food. No, yeah. And Dory, the medical issues is pretty complex, but there's a contract with a company called Wexford that provides health care for the department. And what Illinois pays for per person for medical care in the state I wish I had Alan Mills from Uptown People's Laws slide on that because it is, when you see the list of all the states and what they spend on, on incarceration medical care, we're at the very bottom. So it's a choice we're making about the money, money we're willing to spend to take care of people's health. And those resources are very, very limited. I know um, Alan was at a training I was at recently and was talking about in order to see a doctor, you have to see a nurse three times on three separate visits. And when you finally do get to see the doctor, you can only see them about one thing that you've written on a piece of paper and they can't talk about anything else oh. in that visit. You have to go through the whole process again. And, and every time you do that, there's also a cost involved. Um, so it, it really is um, very limited in, in what kind of care you can receive. Betsy had a question and then there's another question in the chat we can do next. So Betsy. Um, yeah, I, I just, seems the whole crux of the matter is the purpose of the prison is to punish, not rehabilitate, not try to make this person turn from what they were doing to become, come back and be a citizen, a contributor. <laughs> so I, you know, I, until we can get out of that mindset that prison is there the sole purpose is just to punish uh, and not to do anything else. I, you know, I, I don't know if you have thoughts about how we change that. <laughs> you know. It's a, it's a culture, you know, uh, like when you do have a good employee uh, that works for the department of correction and they do show that they care, they're shunned and put in bad work situations, you know, talked about and ridiculed all because they care. 
jerks and the jerks get the promotions. They get the, you know, they go far. It's a culture in the Department of Correction. And every, you know, in from every aspect, from how they treat the inmate, from how they treat our attorneys to how they treat our loved ones. It's, it's a culture, a culture of disrespect and disdain. Betsy, it's such a good question that you raise. My colleague James, if he was here, he would say, you know, going to prison is the punishment. Like just that in itself is the punishment. So it doesn't make sense the way that we treat people. We think about everybody created in the image of God and deserving of human dignity. That is not happening in our country. But there are places where it is. If you think about Nordic countries like Germany, or I don't know if you've been following the reporting that Natalie Moore has been doing at WBZ about Finland and open prisons. Like that's a radically different way from thinking about incarceration and, and what is the use of it and how to get people prepared to be part of the community and not sever those ties, but um, try to strengthen them while someone's going through this rehabilitative time. You know, that would be just imagine what, what our world would be like in our country if that really was the focus. I think there is another question about um, GEDs and how, what the opportunities for you to get a GED and versus, I know you said you couldn't, so talk about that again, if you would, Nelson. Yeah, sure. Well, it's all time-based. So that's how they do most educational classes, uh, programs. They feel like the person with the shortest out day, I guess, can use the, the GED more or whatever. So they go by outdates. So if you have 40 years and I have 25 years and we both go and sign up for school, I'm going to go into this because I have 25 years. And everybody that have under 40 years, they're going to continue to put under me. So if you have life, they don't even put you on the list. It's like, no, you not, no, we don't do it. So it just depends on your time. And Nelson, would you say it depends on the institution? Because was all your time in max institutions? All my time was in max institutions, except for the last, the last four years. Yeah, the last four years. And, and, and even then, it was a media max. I was in Hill. They were sending a lot of guys with life to Hill. And uh, so it was, it was a max. But I got a chance to spend a year in Vienna. I paroled from, from Vienna. That was a minimum. So one of the things the Department of Corrections is doing now is the lesser the security. So for minimums or reentry centers, they're focusing a lot more programming. But um, one of the model reentry centers is Kiwani. It's just really, really, really hard to get into. But if you can get into it, there is a lot of programming you could take advantage of. But you have to write an essay and apply, and it's really selective. It's like um, selective enrollment for college. It feels yes, like. you got to be. You got to have. You can you can have no more than four four and under years to, be, to serve, uh, uh, no gang ties, no ticket, no disciplinary ticket within the last three years, and like 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 Lizzie said, you have to write an essay and you have to sh uh, 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 let them know everything that you have already accomplished since you've been incarcerated. I know I had to go through it. Yeah. But there's a Betsy, there's a question from Nancy first in the okay. okay, and then I'll uh, then you. So how old were you when you were sent to so this is Nelson? How old were you when you were sent to adult prison instead of juvenile? I never went to juvenile. I was 17. I went straight from Cook County Jail to prison. To adult prison. Yes. Yeah. I never did a day in juvenile. Okay. Thank you. Betsy. Um well, related, has that changed at all? Has that age, has there been any legislation about raising that age or disallowing? I think they raise it to anything 18, right? Like you know, under 18, anything under 18. So if you're 17, you're considered a juvenile now, whereas opposed, you wasn't. But they're not thinking of doing it to 25 or anything like that. I mean, Try. we would love to raise the age and yeah. And when they say 18, they mean it. It's it's the day your birthday is when you get yes. into the adult prison is, is on your birthday. Mm -hmm. So just, I was going to ask because the chat went by and I don't know if we'll be able to access that report link. If you could add that to your 
And you said you were going to make slides or give us the slides. Yeah. Somehow, if you could add yeah. that so we have that. Um, yeah, we can do that. And also, I don't know if everyone knows this or not, but if you open up your chat, there's three dots. There's a picture of a of a document, and then there's a smiley face, and there's three dots. If you click on the three dots, there's a save chat option, and that will save the chat to your computer. But well, those links will be in the right, Lindsay, in the um, slides. Okay. I have a question about the extra classes you took to prepare yourself to to leave prison. Did you find those on? How did you find those? Because you said you took the that was under your own initiative. So how did that work? That must have been a lot of work to find, maybe. Through my boss, my boss was seeing me for some years, and she used to give me books, and she would ask me what did I want to read, and then when I couldn't really tell her, she would recommend books and books that would inspire me or whatever so I could know my own taste and what I like to read. So yeah, through my boss, and like even when I was studying for my GED, because like I said, I, I couldn't take it until I got my time change. They sent me books on arithmetic and math and uh, uh, word science, and, you know, and things of that, that nature. My so, boss. If you had, so if you had a question about the arithmetic, where did, who did you ask? You know, I had an officer, and you, okay. a, 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 a Southern Trumper, good guy though, really good guy, and he, used, but he loved math. Math was like his thing, and I struggled with math, always have. And this was an officer, and he had my wing, and he used to say, "Hey Nelson, we're gonna study at eight o'clock." He was a Southern dude, really Southern. And he would come, and he would come to my cell. And he would come in my cell, and we would do math for like two hours. Wow. Like three days out the week. And I learned a lot from him. I, I, yeah, right? Yeah, I just couldn't imagine doing math without help. That's why I thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I would just say thank you to both Lindsay and Nelson. Um, you know, we know that this isn't a good system, but then when we hear Nelson's stories, it's so much worse than I could ever imagine. So it's it's really a service to humanity that you're getting out here and telling your story. Thank you, Nelson. And thank hey, you I for bringing it to us. Well, I appreciate you and I thank you. And just to let y'all know, uh, I am a Christian. I love Christ very much. And it was Christ that I leaned on in my darkest hours. Just let you know, like, I, yeah. That's Prayer powerful. works. Prayer yeah. works. He, he gave me a miracle. He brought me home. Nancy, thank you for saying that. We are so blessed to have Nelson on our team. There are many, many Nelsons in the Department of Corrections right now. There are so many amazing people um, that could be doing so much in our communities right now. So thank you for this chance to share um, so you can join and support efforts um, to bring more people like Nelson home. Yes, thank you. Can thank Nelson for your opening up and telling us how, how life was for many, many years. Because all we do is can see walls and read reports. You never hear the real story. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. yeah. So Lindsay, uh, so will you let either me or Nancy, you know, if there's legislation coming up that you need our help writing letters or petitions or whatever, you kind of let us know and we can pass it on to others? Uh, Absolutely. And I, I would say this is actually what the advocacy team is designed to do. So whenever there is legislation we need help on, we go to our advocacy team first. So consider doing that and I will, I will absolutely keep you in the loop. Um, 
for this particular session, I'm expecting us to do a lot of defense work. The climate is not such that it's very open right now to criminal justice reform in a meaningful way. Um, but like I mentioned in our take action, we're really concerned about things getting worse and about more people um, getting more time. So um, we will let you know as bills are filed or things might move. I'm, I'm hearing there might be an anti so-called anti-crime package coming. Um, that is something we definitely wanna be ready to mobilize and, and let people know why that's really not the best solution um, for this moment. So yes, thank you. We will keep you posted and appreciate that. After the election um, that happens in November, there'll be a veto session. And I'm hoping that we can do more proactive things in that veto session or lame duck session in January. So we'll also keep in touch later on in the year as well. Okay. Well, thank, thank you both for coming. We are so delighted to have you and hear all that you're doing. And uh, I know we look forward to getting the slides so we can really internalize. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I will send them out a, a little <laughs> while after Lindsay sends them to me. It's not an exact science. It takes a while to get everyone's uh, emails off the Zoom the Zoom vault or whatever, <laughs> I think that's what I'm calling it right now. Um, we Our next speaker forum presentation is in March and it's gonna be around mental health as we uh, we strive to be a welcoming, inclusive and supportive and engaged church, wise church around mental health. Blessings to both Nelson and Lindsay and all the work that they have to, to do and accomplish. So I thank you um, for coming and taking the time to do an excellent, presentation with so much information. I learned so much. So thank you. Is there any other questions for the good of the cause? Um, I'd just like to mention that we also have a panel discussion on February 16th with Arise Chicago. Oh, right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. I was just talking about the wise one earlier. So Arise Chicago comes first, February 16th, and the Zoom link can be found in our e-blast. And if you need any information whatsoever, you can find my uh, email on our website. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you. All right, everyone have a great night. Yeah, bye.